a very good morning to uh, batch 23 and welcome to year 4 this is your first lecture on pharmacotherapy prescription writing and uh, referral letter writing i am dr lahari here the um, learning outcomes for this lecture would be to apply basic pharmacotherapy in routine dental practice write a prescription for a dental patient and relate to the legal liabilities of any inappropriate prescription as well as write a, le a referral letter to a specialist so these may sound very complicated but in reality they are quite simple and in year four you will be learning all of these and uh, as well as practicing uh, this in uh, um, routine clinical uh, settings so um, pharmacotherapy, uh, we're just going to touch at what you've already learned in year three and in year uh, two, basic pharmacology. So in dental setting, the most important areas where you need to give medication to a patient is primarily for dental pain, followed by common orofacial, bacterial, viral or fungal uh, infections and uh, antibiotic prophylaxis that means uh, giving antibiotics before you do any treatment especially for cases suspected to have infective endocarditis and um, precautions that you need to take during uh, pregnancy and for lactating women so let's look at the common nsaids first of all i hope you remember that nsaids stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and uh, for dental pain right so uh, let's look at this table I've, uh, is essentially just uh, showing you some of the most commonly available analgesics and their trade names or brand names and dosaging and whether you can use them over the counter and what are they referred for. Uh, so let's start with uh, one by one. First of all is uh, paracetamol also the other uh, chemical name is acetaminophen. The common brand name available is Panadol and the usual adult dosage is 500 milligrams. Uh, TDS stands for three times a day and it is an over-the-counter drug. OTC stands for that and it's generally useful for mild pain. Ibuprofen, trade name Brufen, um, generally available as uh, um, you know a 200 to 400 uh, milligram tablet and uh, given three times a day and also it, it can be given as a prescription drug but sometimes can also be uh, obtained over the counter so this is given for mild to moderate so similarly if you've noticed mephenomic acid which is called a sponstan diclofenac Voltrin, yeah so all of these are over the counter and is very commonly available uh, available in our clinic as well and preferred for mild to moderate pain the next one is Celicoxib, the uh, trade name is Celebrex. This is different from these NSAIDs because it's a COX-2 inhibitor. I'm sure you remember the COX-2 inhibitors are preferred for cases where there is uh, gastritis and it doesn't cause gastritis because its pathway or its mechanism of action is slightly different. It acts on COX-2 instead of COX-1. Uh, the last one here is not an NSAID. It is Tremadol, which is uh, uh, an opioid analgesic and uh, the common trade name uh, the name is tramol available as 50 milligrams and generally preferred to be given only once a day so the uh, celecoxib and tramadol are generally only a uh, prescription medication cannot be usually purchased over the counter so if you have noticed your tramadol is reserved for severe uh, pain uh, episodes moving on now this is a stepwise guide for orofacial pain which we, which i have taken from uh, burkitt's you will notice uh, that uh, <clears throat> here this gives you an idea of what type of analgesic to choose. So let's say if your patient is coming to you with pain, yes, then you do an oral examination and he's still experiencing pain. Then you uh, analyze and is the co component of pain, uh, you know, is it related to orofacial pain? Uh, if yes, then what are the, this is your hierarchy of medication. You would want to choose a mild to moderate pain. What would you want to give the patient? I mean, it's related to dental pain and, uh, um, you know, how, how you choose the medication is written here. So, uh, and then you may need to reevaluate the patient if there is still pain even after 48 hours of medication. 
Now, on the other hand, if your patient is not in pain and pain is anticipated following a dental procedure, let's say you've done an extraction for the patient and you want to give him uh, analgesic so that in anticipation of pain or you've done a root canal procedure and after the local anesthetic wears off, there is going to be pain. Uh, so this is called as preemptive analgesia and again you have a choice of medication which can be you know celecoxib with the steroid 30 minutes before the procedure or uh, if it's not indicated then it's not indicated right so you could also give uh, analgesics uh, which fall in the, this range the usual NACID is also following a simple extraction or simple root canal treatment but if it's a more difficult procedure which is going to give a lot of pain to the patient then you could give analgesic before the procedure that is what is preemptive analgesia so there's a new term that you've learned today preemptive analgesia moving on let's look at some of the common antibiotics used in dentistry now this list here is just some of the most commonly used available uh, medication it is not very extensive it is very basic and I want you to pay very close attention to this because and antibiotics are some things which generally students go wrong with and uh, <clears throat> especially with their dosaging. So it's important that you remember the dosaging. Now when I have written here 250 to 500, it means it could be for an adolescent and an adult, right? So it's not necessary that you could give any of this uh, in this range. It's important to note that generally adult dosaging is 500 milligrams. For example, for amoxicillin, it's 500 milligrams three times a day. Right? So the duration is generally 5 to 7 days. Augmentin, reserved for very severe infection. It's a combination of amoxicillin and clavulinic acid. Uh, it's a combination drug, so it contains about 500 to 875 milligrams of the drug. I mean, it's available as a combination, again, 5 to 7 days. But it's given only twice daily. Erythromycin, one of the best alternatives for penicillin allergy, 250 to 500 milligrams, 3 times a day. Uh, or even four times a day, five to seven days duration. Azithromycin is 500 milligram tablet. It's only given for three times a day. It's convenient doses, but again, it's reserved for very severe infections. 500 milligrams OD for f uh, day one, followed by 250 milligrams OD for the next four days. Or you could just give 500 mg OD for three continuous days. Metronidazole, often given in combination with amoxicillin, especially for uh, um, dental infections where anaerobic organisms are expected for example third molar impaction or pericoronitis it's uh, available in the dosage range of 200 to 400 but 400 is a preferred milligrams 400 milligrams is preferred adult dosaging three times a day for five to seven days cephalexin is a cephalosporin again similar dosaging 500 milligrams three times a day clindamycin um, 150 to 400 milligrams is available uh, and it is given in the dosaging of three times a day generally or sometimes can be extended to four times a day. Doxycycline is a tetracycline, 100 milligrams BD is the dosage. And ciprofloxacin, uh, I forgot to mention the dosaging here, it is about uh, five to seven days. That's the uh, duration that is it, it is generally given for. So, um, the most common pathogen associated with uh, orofac uh, facial infection, again, this is again taken from Burkitt's, is the most common one is Streptococcus, followed by Actinomycetes uh, and Fusobacterium and the others, and uh, the least common one would be Valionella. So, the spectrum of activity for most of the antibiotics used, if, if you were to classify them in uh, relation to orofacial infections, the narrow spectrum ones are these, clindamycin, erythromycin falling under this, macrolides. Uh, cephalosporins are extended and broad spectrum is anti uh, augmented. So you would reserve the uh, broad spectrum ones only when you really need them for uh, infections where you are expecting a, a lot of variety of bacteria. For otherwise the simple penicillin uh, and uh, you know uh, the erythromycin are more than enough to clear the usual infections. <coughs> oh, yeah and an important thing to note is amoxicillin comes under extended spectrum penicillin right so one of the preferred antibiotic in dental infections now um, since we're talking about antibiotics it's very important to understand the term antibiotic resistance um, and or antimicrobial resistance as it can be termed and definitely there is a lot of uh, discussion about this especially from the world health organization because it's a huge concern there are various reasons why uh, bacteria and human beings are turning resistant to majority of the antibiotics what it means is that generally simple antibiotic which would be enough to kill organisms and cure the patient is not able to do that because the organism has now mutated and has become more and more resistant to the older available drugs. Now there are various reasons for this. 
some of the reasons are over prescribing of antibiotics and dentists also uh, play a part in this because uh, you tend to keep your patient happy and prescribe antibiotics and to get rid of infection very early you know uh, or in le less amount of time which could have generally be done uh, for example in case of dental abscess by just treating the decayed tooth or draining the abscess or doing an extraction and now patients uh, not taking antibiotics as prescribed is another major cause that means your recommended dosaging was 500 milligrams three times a day uh, for five days but the patient ends up taking it only for three days because he feels that he's cured so that's another reason why uh, you could have resistant developing organisms um, the, the organism starts developing resistance next is extensive amount of use in of antibiotics in agriculture as well as in uh, animal uh, industry and animal husbandry that's another reason why <clears throat> poor infection control in hospitals and clinics also could lead to developing organisms which are more resistant poor hygiene and sanitation prices uh, practices this is again we are aware with what we are dealing with right now in the covid 19 but that's a virus of course and antibiotics are not effective against viruses and lack of uh, rapid laboratory tests uh, like uh, this this uh, means that the you know the the resistant the organism is not being tested in empirical antibiotics when they're given uh, it tends to you know kill a lot of other organisms which are not really needed and, and you uh, and tend to use extended or broader spectrum antibiotics more often uh, also another important thing to note that in the last 20 years there have been no new antibiotics that have been discovered very very few so that's why we're running out of the world is actually running out of antibiotics so what could we do is first of all get informed gather data prevent infection regulate the medicine and of course invest your time now in it so um, that's what you know we need to uh, try and change so this is taken from the national antibiotic guidelines uh, they've come up with guidelines in 2019 also which is very similar to the 2014 version um, given by the ministry of health and this is how how you uh, in uh, oral and dental surgery uh, this uh, table shows you that if this is a sort of infection what is the preferred antibiotic what is the alternative antibiotic and a little bit of remarks or comments here so, for example, if there's a clean surgery, which is a class one surgery, uh, you know, you're incising a tumor or a cyst or submandibular gland surgery. Um, for most of the time, it need not be indicated antibiotic. But if uh, yes, in case of open reduction, um, and uh, you know, if they've divided the surgeries into class one, class two, and class uh, three surgeries. So for the class two surgeries, you would give amoxicillin one gram. Um, you know per oral or clindamycin 600 milligrams or benzatine penicillin uh, or an alternative would be you know giving it uh, IV yeah amoxicillin plus clavulinate or cefuroxime or ampicillin or salbactam right and then surgeries which are a little more extensive like orthognathic surgery you would prefer to give uh, uh, benzyl penicillin or clindamycin or amoxicillin and uh, for oral maxofacial factors, antibiotics are recommended for immediate post-trauma period and should be discontinued once open reduction and internal fixation is completed. So this is what we are dealing with. The first step is prophylaxis is recommended for all patients with an increased risk of surgical wound infection. That is, a example, an immunocompromised patient. It's important that you really need to give uh, the patient uh, antibiotics but uh, incision and drainage and management of the cause of the abscess and symptomatic relief is more important lastly osteomyelitis for acute cases uh, yes <coughs> it's important to put the patient on uh, uh, antibiotic and uh, these are the alternatives again penicillin would be the choice followed by um, you know clindamycin as an alternative and culture and sensitivity is necessary so looking at the stepwise guideline when considering prescribing antibiotics again first of all you need to know that, it, that does your patient have an active infection active infection if it's yes then you would do an examination and then in, give the patient the uh, antibiotic coverage if required uh, based on your clinical judgment if no then maybe uh, you know signs and symptoms improve uh, you know without uh, if, yeah sorry the no is here antibiotic is not indicated 
if antibiotic is indicated and the signs and symptoms continue to uh, improve then complete the entire course okay uh, if no then yes you need to uh, go back to see what went wrong if after 72 hours of also the patient's uh, symptoms have not yet improved if your patient doesn't have an active infection then is the patient at risk of infection due to cardiac or to orthopedic or an immune compromised situation if yes then you might to give prophylaxis so the term prophylaxis is used whenever you're giving antibiotic before you start treatment suspecting that the patient would have uh, will get infected no then you don't need antibiotics so that is this uh, prescribing guideline now let's go to the next uh, topic which is uh, medication used common medication used in pregnancy or breastfeeding now first of all again you should importantly understand that uh, you should be familiar with uh, these groups of drugs which are important in these patients analgesics and anti-inflammatory antibiotic local anesthetic sedative and emergency medicines so um, <clears throat> these are uh, the safety based on relative safety of the commonly used medication in pregnancy or breastfeeding patient this is the table which shows you some commonly used analgesics aspirin the uh, pregnancy during pregnancy is completely avoid the fda pregnancy category is c and even breastfeeding is important to avoid so for some weird reason the spelling of avoid some somehow is not correct yes uh, paracetamol is the one of the most safest analgesic during pregnancy as well as um, breastfeeding and that's why it's in the category of b ibuprofen or and other nsaids better to avoid in third trimester because they are in the category c but during breastfeeding they are safe prednisone is and why are we talking about this here this is an anti-inflammatory and it's a steroid to be completely avoided during pregnancy uh, but maybe during breastfeeding if it's required it could be given now let's look at some antimicrobials i mean antibiotics and antifungals during pregnancy and their fda categories uh, pregnancy safety category this can be found uh, in any of the um, drug uh, index indices or also in your pharmacology textbook and safety during uh, breastfeeding amoxicillin yes is one of the safest uh, antibiotic category b and even during uh, breastfeeding erythromycin is also best alternative for amoxicillin and one of the safest but during breastfeeding to be used with caution because sometimes there is a chance that it can cause the uh, barrier and be excreted in breast milk metronidazole safe during pregnancy but during breastfeeding it is to be avoided very important to understand this here because metronidazole uh, can be expressed in the breast milk and reach the baby cephalexin is a cephalosporin yes it is safe clindamycin is also considered safe tetracycline or doxycycline is completely to be avoided even during pregnancy and during breastfeeding chlorhexidine is a topical um, antimicrobial and it is safe to use during both pregnancy and breastfeeding uh, nystatin from here on the color changes these boxes are all antifungals so you will understand this clearly <clears throat> nystatin is safe to use fluconazole uh, maybe single dose regimen can be used but better to be avoided during breastfeeding clotrimazole topical yes definitely safe so i'm talking about topical they are safe but then the ones which you swallow um, parenteral administration uh, only nystatin is considered safe and fluconazole can be avoided during breastfeeding um, extensive I you would want to go back and refer to your pharmacology textbook for more details all right so uh, this is uh, prescription writing guidelines a person who signs a prescription is the one who will be held accountable and should should something go wrong that's a very important statement issued by the Malaysian Medical Council um, <clears throat> under the duties of a doctor so a prescription should have essentially the following important information First of all the patient details and the next side is the prescription details. In the patient details it's important uh, obviously the name, address and contact number and very importantly identification number that the IC number of the patient has to be there. Drug regimen, name of the drug, the dose, frequency, um, administra how it is administered and uh, duration of usage is important. Okay, So any of this information found to be missing is considered as a incomplete prescription. And of course, doctor signature and stamp, name and address, and the date of prescribing. Very, very important, critical information. So, a prescription should be written legibly. That means it should be readable. If you're not, handwriting is not very good, then it's important that you print it. Right? So, this has been taken from the good uh, guide to good dispensing. 
So common abbreviations that are used in prescriptions are OD, which is daily, every other day, no prescription, BID and TID, QID and some other, uh, you know, abbreviations. So uh, this is just an example of how the prescription should look like and what are all the important things that you need to highlight in the prescription. So the name, date of birth, strength of the medication, the frequency, route of administration. And you know, if you're writing 30, for example, your numbers are not clear, you might want to spell it out. Uh, the date, the sign of the doctor, refills, how many drug tablets should the pharmacist uh, you know, dispense, what is the amount that you want the patient to take and what is the name of the medication. So uh, there are generally errors seen in prescription writing initially, especially more when you are not an uh, experienced prescription writer. So it's important that you know students learn how to write uh, legible and clear uh, prescriptions. And it's important that the doctors counter check the prescri prescription as well. So inadequate knowledge of the patient and their clinical status are one of the reasons why you end up with wrong prescriptions. Uh, this could be because of poor history taking. For example, patient has clearly told you that, uh, you know, he is having gastritis and you end up giving him a strong analgesic uh, instead of preferring an analgesic like celecoxib, which does not cause gastritis in that patient. Inadequate drug knowledge, not knowing much about the medication itself without doing your uh, background reading and you end up prescribing a medication. Calculating errors, especially if you're giving child dosaging and you make errors in calculating the uh, amount of drug to be given. Having illegible handwriting, using short forms, if any of that, then it's better you print the medication, uh, your prescription so that it's very clear. And having drug name confusions. You know, that can be very, very uh, embarrassing if you're having drug name confusions. There's always a, a drug index which you can refer to. It's available in the clinics or you can log into it online. It's called MIMS.com, Malaysian Drug Index. So you could have slips and lapses where the actions uh, do not go according to a plan. For example, intending to write 5 milligrams, but unintentionally writing 50. Now that's a terrible mistake. Mistakes where the plan itself is going wrong. Writing 50 milligrams of the drug, not knowing that it's actually a 5 milligrams. So you know, there you're confusing the person who's dispensing the drug by writing wrong prescriptions. So it's important that you have a good uh, pharmacist or you know a plan of action where the pharmacist can actually correct you or call you back asking you that uh, I have made a mistake. I mean, is there a mistake, doctor? Was it really 50 milligrams you wanted to give or was it a five, right? So that's why it's important to uh, see, counter check your prescription when you're writing. And it's important to write legible prescription because if you write something like this, it would be impossible for anyone to read it. Right, so now we're coming to nearly the last part of the lecture, which is a referral letter writing. So why do you need to learn how to write a referral letter? Referral, referral letter means that uh, writing a letter to some other doctor and sending your patient over to some other doctor. So generally the reasons why you refer to a specialist or another uh, practitioner would be, uh, you know, maybe the doc patient has a systemic condition that requires appropriate referral for dental treatment at a special center and you are probably in a primary health center which cannot uh, treat this sort of patients or it's a co complex case which may require referral um, you know because you have your personal limitations let's say your clinic doesn't have that sort of facility and you uh, would want to refer the patient off so what should this referral letter include it should include again very important information basic information about the patient there's a name ic number address date of birth, gender, and if you have any patient record number, if it exists. Practitional details, that means about you and about uh, referral details, about writing what the details of the referral itself is. Any special requirements that the patient required, that means if the patient is probably on a wheelchair or has uncontrolled diabetics, uh, diabetes, sorry. History of the patient and examination findings, let's say you found that there's a lymph node uh, palpable or you found that there's a deep cavity, it's important to write down. Investigations, if you already conducted any, it's important to write down what the results of those investigations were. Uh, it could be lab investigations or x-rays. Any social context, let's say the patient is um, having uh, uh, some speech difficulties or is, ha is uh, having, uh, um, is bisexual or having uh, any social other social problems, it's important to attend to that. Uh, medication and uh, medical uh, devices if they are in use or a previous medication which the patient is already consuming or medication which you have prescribed and you want the specialist to also know about it 
any allergies or adverse reactions which the patient might have any safety alerts and of course any legal information now that is again a very important point because uh, uh, this could be important if the patient is um, uh, a minor or if the patient is uh, uh, involved in any uh, road traffic accident and this is a legal case and you are the dentist treating dentist and you're referring the patient uh, after that so this is an example of a referral letter to an endodontist here where you write this is where you write down doctor's name office address etc that means this is your details if you have a letterhead that's even better and this is the details of the endodontist whom you're referring the patient to so dear endodontist we have referred a patient uh, for treatment for example of 36 uh, this patient was new to us this month he needs extensive crown um, work that means crown and ridge and the caries on 36 extends far subgingivally i have uh, referred him to, him to the periodontist dr periodontist for crown lengthening surgery and a comprehensive periodontal evaluation I told Dr. Perio that you might prefer to have the crown lengthening done prior to your completion of root canal treatment. So that's the reason why the patient, is, the doctor is actually writing a letter to the endodontist. Also, you want the doctor to evaluate uh, a tutu. It carries also extends far subgingivally, has a periapical abscess, and the canals appear quite calcified. So that's the reason why this um, doctor is referring off the patient to an endodontist. This tooth might be better treated with removal. Let me know if you need any more information. Sincerely, Dr. So and so. So I hope you've understood how this referral letter is written. Clear details, clear information of what you want the surgeon or the doctor to do for you and what has already been done. Right? So if there are any records, that is the x-rays, they should all be sent to this uh, next doctor as well. So that the doctor doesn't have to repeat taking those x-rays or those lab investigations again. Right, so uh, this is a referral letter to a physician. I mean, a as a dentist, you're referring the f uh, to the physician before the patient undergoes some, uh, for example, here, hip replacement surgery. Again, details of the doctor who's uh, referring the patient and details of the doctor to whom the patient is being referred to. Dear Dr. Orthopedic, I have completed the dental treatment on patient so-and-so and, -so and f have found her to be in excellent oral health. I can find no potential source for subacute infection at this time. I have discussed this with the patient and the possibility that after her replacement, hip replacement, you will want her to pre-medicate with antibiotics before any dental treatment. Sincerely. Okay. So that is what is the um, advice or, or that is what is the uh, reason for referral. So I hope you understand now that how a paid referral letter has to be written and why it should be written. Now the reasons for why it should be written could be various depending on the complexity of the case. Okay, uh, And it's important to understand that it is not, uh, uh, it's not uh, be, be, uh, less becoming of the patient, of the doctor to refer off a case, right? It's, it's for the good of the patient that the patient is being referred to a doctor who can probably help the patient better than uh, your own ability.